go anywhere. <laughs> How you doing? Good. All right, we're going to start the J. Scott seminar. Those of you who do not know who J. Scott is, he's an uh, outfitter in Arizona, Colorado, and Mexico. And where he hunts and how he hunts, especially on coos deer, requires an immense amount of time behind optics. I had the fortunate chance to go down and hunt in Mexico with, with Jay for coos deer. And he taught me so much about glassing and so much about the right setup for that type of hunt. And I learned so much. It's changed how I've hunted now everywhere I go. So um, you're going to learn a lot from Jay. He's got a great, lot of great advice and incredible experience in doing it. Thanks for coming out here today. It's a pleasure. Thanks. Looking forward to it. Well, I, I honestly thought by the time I would go, there would be about two of you left. I'm glad to see that you guys have uh, stuck it out, and I'm looking forward to sharing with you guys. Before we get into the seminar, I just want to take a poll of the audience and ask how many people in here actually have a tag in their pocket for deer, elk, sheep, bear that they're going to be hunting this fall? Okay, quite a few of you. How many of you have sheep tags this year? So one, two, three of you, okay. Um, how many of you have glassed with a tripod? Okay, how many of you have not glassed with a tripod? Okay. If I were to point out this tripod right here and say that if you come glass with me on hunts, now your hunts may be different, but if you come with me, and I said, I don't ever want to see your tripod in this configuration. Is there anybody here that doesn't know why I would say that? So you guys all, all know why I don't like the tripod to look like this. You don't. This tripod, everything is extended. The legs are extended. The center post is extended, which I don't have any binoculars mounted on here, but if I did, if you're standing here and glassing, I'm happy that you're using this tripod, but I would rather see you take this leg, push it up so you're using the more solid portion of the tripod rather than these flimsy legs down here at the bottom. So if you have to stand and glass, that's okay. But if that's your standard method of practice, I would highly discourage that. I would highly discourage ever extending the center post. I have a center post that's a lot longer that if I have to stand, I will use it. But I have people show up and I'm sitting down either on a glassing stool or on my rear end stable with my tripod as low as possible to be steady. And I'll look over and my client will be standing, it'll be windy and they'll be glassing standing. And I say, you know, what are you doing? Well, I'm glassing. I say, I think you'll find more if you drop these bottom legs, so you go with the more sturdy portion of the tripod, you extend the legs out to give you a wider platform, and never extend this if you, if you can help it. So um, that's, just, that's just one little tip to start out there with. Um, I can do a seminar, my wife says, how many slides are you going to do? You have like a hundred slides. I can do a seminar on glassing and optics, and I can also do a seminar on aging and field judging bighorn sheep. If I were to pull the audience, pull the audience, how many of you want to hear about optics and glassing? Okay, I think that's an overwhelming. So we'll cover glassing and optics, and if we get into the sheep stuff, we'll cover that as well. So. Uh, I want to thank Jason and I want to thank Kuyu for inviting me out. I want to cover in this, this seminar, I want, to, I want to talk about optics, I want to talk about glassing and letting your eyes do the work for you. Um, I know we've got uh, Tim Allen here who's a successful coos deer hunter who's a phenomenal glasser, he uses big binoculars and he's learned over time that the more time that he can stay stationary, and glass at longer distances, he can pick up more game. How many of you would you feel like you fall into the category that you typically walk a little more than you should, and, and you don't glass as much as you should? A few of you? Okay. I would tell you, unless you're hunting country that is super thick, 
that you can't see. If you have the ability to look in open areas, areas where you can see, let your, let your optics and your eyes do the walking for you. Let, that, let the optics do the work for you. you. You want to know about what type of optics. How many of you own a 25 power or more optic? Uh, not a spotting scope, binocular. Okay, a couple of you. How many of you own 8 or 10 power binoculars? Okay, the majority of you. 8 or 10 power binoculars can, are the most widely used binocular, and I think a 10 power binocular is what I prefer to have with me at all times, to wear around my neck in my Kuyu Bino harness. The reason that I want to have a 10 power binocular is that I have a wide field of view and you can actually handhold a pair of 10 powers. Now, you can also take a pair of 10 powers and put them on a tripod and glass very well with them. You don't have to have 15 power or 25 power or 40 power for that. You can do very well. But you're going to see more game with those 10 powers that most all of you have if you put them on a tripod. How many of you hunt in country that you think what I'm talking about is absolutely nonsense and you don't see any need for glassing on a track with a tripod? Okay, one of you. Probably hunting thick country where you can't see more than probably 100, 200 yards maybe? Okay, um, that, that's completely valid. 12 and 15 power binoculars, I found that the 12 Swarovski ELs, that when you get above 10 power optics, they're very hard to hold with your hands and to hold steady and to find game consistently. Uh, I'm a big believer in the 15 power Swarovskis. I've had every generation of the 15s that they've made. Uh, I feel like the latest version of the, the 15s are phenomenal, probably the best all around coos deer, bighorn sheep, western, you know, mule deer hunting binoculars made. Uh, let's talk about big eyes. You know, we're talking 25 power. How many of you have looked through a pair of 20 power or more binoculars? You've looked through them. Hold them, hold them up so I can see them. Okay, I'd say about half of you. Um, when you get to 25 power, and Koa makes a, a 32 uh, by 82, Doctor makes a 25 to 50 variable and a, a 40 power wide angle. Uh, the new Swarovski BTX, which is the angled uh, uh, binocular. Um, then there's the Swarovski Twin Spotters. I have kind of gone through all of those and I'm back to the Swarovski Twin Spotters. Uh, and I feel like for my eyes, those are the best. That's one thing I wanted to point out. You'll read, and if do any of you listen to my podcast, okay, a few of you, you'll hear people say, oh, these are my favorite pair of binoculars. These are my, I like the Koas for the big eyes. I like the twin spotters. Everybody's eyes are different. That's something that I wanted to make a point of. Spotting scope, how many of you in here have a spotting scope? How many would you guys say would routinely use a spotting scope? Okay, so that it dropped quite a bit. A bunch of you have them, but it, in my opinion, I see people glassing with a spotting scope, actually trying to find game with a spotting scope, and it makes me cringe. It can be done, and it seems like the younger you are and the younger your eyes are, the more you can do it for a longer period of time. But that's where some of the big eyes are phenomenal because you can look at great long distances where what you're trying to do is look through one eye. I would maybe transition more to a big eye binocular. Spotting scopes must be mounted on a tripod. You can't handhold a spotting scope. I have seen pictures like in Alaska and up in the North Country where they do take a spotting scope, they get it on a rock, but I, I don't recommend that at all. Power ranges uh, range from uh, uh, 20 power to uh, 20 power to 70 power on most scopes. Uh, they're used for clarifying and identifying, uh, not for glassing. The, the next slide here is actually a picture of 1250s. Notice it is mounted on a tripod, and I'm actually looking at that far band, uh, 
you can see like where it's a white band. I'm actually glassing above that for bighorn sheep. That's a 12 power. Uh, those are 15 power binoculars. That's actually in uh, Mexico. Uh, those are an 8 power binocular. These are the long range uh, big eyes that I like. This is a, tw a 25 by 50 uh, by 65 objective Swarovski, what I call twin spotters. Those are mounted on a bracket from a guy in Prescott. If you guys are interested, you can contact me later. I'll put you in touch with them. If you notice what's going on here in this picture, I should probably point out over here. Um, here's a client, he's about to, he's laying down, he's about to shoot at a coos deer, and I'm actually watching the coos deer through the, the big eyes. I really like having that magnification, especially when I'm trying to call a shot. So that's a, a, a huge benefit for me as an outfitter using a high-powered binocular that I can actually see where the bullet's hitting and I want as much magnification as I can. Are the slides driving here? They should be the Koas. Yeah. Okay, those are the 32 power Koas by 82. So 32 on the ocular. Uh, 82 on the objective. Those weigh 14 pounds. That tripod weighs about 14 pounds. I own those when they first came out. I had them for about five years. Optically, they're from a phenomenal glass, uh, but they're, you're starting out with 28 to 30 pounds, including the head. You've got about 30 pounds in your backpack before you even start. Um, the more I carried those, the more I was hoping for something lighter. Uh, this picture is actually the Swarovski BTX. Um, I believe that's the I believe that's the 95 objective on that. And this is a new phenomenon, a new product from Swarovski that's really done well. People, have, it's been very well received. The next photo is me actually glassing with that BTX in Colorado, and I believe the objective lens, which you've got the ocular, which is up by my eye, and you've got the objective, which is uh, the, the longer portion, and that is a 65 millimeter. Here you've got me glassing for some bighorn sheep. I've actually got my 30 by 70 eyepiece with a 95 millimeter uh, objective there. Do I have any questions about 8s, 10s, 12s, 15s, and big eyes? No? Okay. Uh, like I said before, I'm going to bump up to this first slide so you guys can kind of laugh. That's me actually making a joke, hand holding the 32 power, 14 pound koas just to get a photo so you guys could uh, get a kick out of that. If you want to be an effective glasser, in my opinion, you have to glass off of a tripod. I did this as kind of a joke. Use a tripod for a more steady and stabilized look. Uh, a sturdy tripod with less vibration makes for better glassing. You get carbon fiber or you get a, a, an aluminum tripod. I prefer carbon fiber. Uh, the, the, this is not the tripod that I glass with every day. This is um, Jason's tripod. I just wanted it for a prop. This is a carbon fiber tripod. This one is made by Manfrotto. This is a very, uh, what I would call sturdy tripod. This is not one you would want to use uh, backpacking or if you're trying to go ultra light. Uh, I like a company called Slick. Uh, a 724CF2 is actually the, it's a three leg tripod. I can actually, I have a long center post and I can actually stand behind it and glass. The circumstances when I would actually stand to glass would be a lot of times if I'm walking a ridge and I'm mule deer hunting or even if the coos deer or elk and I, I carry it extended with my backpack and a lot of times when I'm moving up and down or you know on a ridge line I'll pop it up glass real fast and then I'll keep walking. Tips for glassing with a tripod. Try to always glass sitting down with a firm base. We talked about that. Don't extend the center post and utilize the leg strength and try not to extend the bottom legs. There's me glassing with the big glasses. Here is uh, my hunting partner, my guiding partner, Dar Colburn. He's actually, this was on a, a mountain goat hunt in Alaska last year. Uh, we, neither one of us took a tripod. Our guide had uh, the tripod and the spotting scope, so we, we didn't even take our 
because guys are like, no, you can spot mountain goats during green grass, no problem, you guys will find them. But notice, Dar is sitting, he's in a position here where his elbows are tucked and he's as stable as possible. If you're just up looking around like this, you're gonna miss stuff. So if you have to handhold, uh, get in a position where you can tuck your elbows in, get in a position where you can crouch and let this kind of act as your stabilize, uh, stabilization or your tripod. This right here uh, is actually an outdoorsman's bino adapter. In my opinion, this outdoorsman's uh, bino adapter is probably one of the single most important things of anything I'll say today. Uh, you can have the greatest binocular and you can have the greatest tripod, whatever brand you want, but if you don't have something that attaches the bino to the tripod and does not wobble, does not have any shake, you've totally defeated your purpose of spending $3,000 on a pair of binoculars and you know, 600 bucks on a tripod. This piece, I want to say it's under $100, is the best I've ever seen that mounts basically any binocular to a tripod. Unfortunately, I don't have one here, but there are some pictures. You can also go check them out on our website. It's called the Outdoorsman's Bino Adapter. And like I said, it's probably the single most important thing or, or the thing that I'm most passionate about. It's the best product for mounting any binocular to a tripod. Uh, there's all sorts of tripods. Okay, here's, here's a picture that I want to point out. And I'm not saying names or anything. This is a young, young kid, so I'm not po poking fun. But if I were to look at this photo, do you see the distance there? He, he is sitting down, but he has this fully extended. What I would do is I would actually extend these legs up and lower the post down. So you can extend the legs up, even if you have to go out, but get this post all the way at the lowest position. You never want a glass with that anywhere other than right there. I'm very adamant about that. This is better than him hand holding, so he does have some bit of stabilization, but he doesn't have, if, he, if wind comes up, he's gonna have vibration and shake. Okay, glassing tips. Learn to pick out good glassing points. I think it's very important that if I tell you to, you know, get low, get your tripod stable, if you're not picking good glassing points, and you don't know how to find a good glassing area, all of the tips of keeping your binoculars stable is not gonna help you. Look for the highest and steepest point in the area is what I typically do. People ask me, well, what do you look for in a glassing point? I wanna go as high and as steep as I can. The reason I want steep is because I can see in a 360 degree direction. If my hill becomes like this, I have to move around in order to see off the edges but if I have a real sharp peak, I can typically just spin, glass over here, turn over here and glass for 30 minutes and just keep rotating. So uh, a highest and steepest point in the area. Uh, look for a point that has rocks, a cliff edge, uh, or an open space with the widest field of view. Big long ridges that are steep off both sides can be great glassing spots as well. Look for knobs and high points where you can move just a little ways and, com and it completely changes your view. So when I'm looking on Google Earth or when I'm looking on a topo map, I wanna look for that one point that's super steep that I wanna look where I can go through a saddle and maybe go this direction and get on another super steep point and it opens up a bunch of new basins. That's what I specifically look for either on a map or when I'm, when I'm actually in the field and I'm driving or walking a new country, I'm like, that's a good glassing point. That's a good glassing point. My preference is to glass great quality country with a smaller view than a huge view with marginal habitat. But oftentimes I glass off both types of knobs. I'm gonna go through quite a bit of, of content here and then we'll get to some more pictures, so don't fall asleep on me. Um, how many of you have late, late hunts for gear or late hunts for elk? Okay, a few of you. This is a good tip. Try to find points that look into north to northeast facing slopes 
where the cover is thick and makes for good bedding ground, shade and cover for more animals that are recovering from a long strenuous rut. When looking at new country, research on the topo maps at cross reference and cross -re reference them on Google Earth. On the topo map, look for contour lines that are very close together. When you see contour lines that are stacked together, that's gonna, sh that's gonna mean when you get there in real life, it's gonna be a steep point. When the contour lines are spread out on a topo map, that means you're gonna get to something that looks more like this. Uh, the reason it's important to find a rock pile is that it often gets you up and away from the brush. If I slip over to the next slide here, you can actually see that I've picked a glassing point out here on a rock. And what it's allowed me to do is look at all this country, whereas if I were to be back here, you can see where I'm down in the brush, but I've actually picked a spot where I can see a lot more below me. Now, one would argue that if you're getting close to an animal that you want to hunt, you don't want to get out and be extremely visible like that. But if you're just prospecting and looking for game, find those little outcroppings where you can see in a, in a, in a long distance. Uh, this is actually my guiding partner, Dar. One thing I want to point out with this photo is, do you notice that he's glassing, like I said, with the center post extension all the way down? Notice that he only has two legs of his tripod, which we talked about, that's what I like. But notice that he actually kind of has to shift because he's looking down, he actually has to kind of come up off his butt. That's okay. Um, probably one of the best glassers you'll ever, he's the best glasser that I know. Um, but he's able to adapt his sitting position so that he can look down into the steep canyon. Uh, but that's okay. Um, some, sometimes people get where they just want to sit on their butt and they're not willing to, to tilt up or tilt down to get the angle. This next photo is Google Earth. I'm a huge uh, fan of Google Earth. You can see here that I like to go and find, delineate. Before I go into a hunting area, I want to pick out spots that I think will be good glassing spots. Here's another uh, Google Earth photo. You can see how I've drawn the red lines are like my ascent to the glassing spot, how I'm going to get up there. The white lines uh, in this photo actually are roads but I, I kind of track where I want to go. So if I'm going to go up this ridge, I can glass down in this basin, and I can turn around and glass in this basin. If I go up this ridge, I can glass down all here and all here. So I'm covering as much country as I can. This is actually a topo map here, and we talked about uh, contour lines getting really close. If, if I just look at this, if you said, where are you going to glass the very first spot, I'm going right there going right out on the tip of that so I can see all of this country. I can look over here. Another spot would be out here on this tip, out here on this tip, out here on this tip. But the very first spot, I'm going right there. That's just an example. It's just a random spot. Glassing tips. Which direction to look? Glass with the sun at your back at first light and you want to scan quicker. I'll, I'll hunt with a lot of people and the sun will be coming up and I'll be, let's say the sun's coming up here, that's, that's east, that's west, and I'm glassing and I'll look over and at first light someone will be looking over here into the shade. I want to use the sun to my advantage. Then I also will see people do the opposite. They'll put the sun at their back and they'll glass till 10 o'clock in the morning with the sun at their back, as well as in the afternoon, they're gonna put the sun at their back and they're, they're gonna be looking at the sunny side of the hill at all times. After about the first hour of glassing, you wanna transition and start glassing into the shade. You will find more animals after an hour after first light. Now there's, this is Southwest, United States type hunting. Lance may say, well, you, you know, you need to glass the sun because they're not going to stand in the shade, but southwest area hunting, you want to glass into the shade. Use the first hour into the, with the, you know, the sun at your back using the sun, but then shift to into the shade. Uh, if it's windy, this is a great tip. If it's windy, Put the wind in your face, glass directly into the wind. I don't care where you're hunting. If it's a strong wind, 
coming from one direction, you turn your tripod, your binoculars, look with the, with the, with the wind blowing directly in your face. You're going to find more game because they're going to be, if the wind's coming straight like this and I'm looking, they're going to be on this slope out of the wind. Huge tip. You'll find way more game if you glass on the lee side. Okay, we covered that. Okay, here's an example of me glassing with the sun at my back. I want to make a point of this slide. I'm, gl I'm glassing with the sun at my back, and in this position, I am glassing and scanning very quickly. The first hour of light, I am going to glass it very, very quickly. I am not going to grid the area. You hear about gridding. In the first hour, I want to be scanning. I'm mostly scanning left to right. Then I drop down. I always, I typically start at the top, and I scan and pan back and forth. And I'm basically taking a paintbrush and just sweeping. So I am looking at all these sunny sides, and I'm looking at the the most obvious spots first. And the first 15 minutes of glassing, I'm just shotgun glassing. I'm looking here, looking there. Any place, any saddle, any place that I think game will be. Then I start slowing down a little bit, and then I start just swiping back and forth. Okay, here's Dar glassing. Uh, this is in Coos Deer Country. Notice how many different ridges he's looking at here. That's a, a good thing to point out. The more country you can see, in most cases, the more animals. He's probably already looked at this. Knowing Dar, he's looking at something up here. But he can cover all of these ridges, all of these ridges from one spot. The, the more country you can see, the more game you'll find. But you can get flooded where you've got so much country, you get overwhelmed, and you, you've got to kind of, in other words, work this close hill first, look it up, then scan all this, then scan all this, and then move to this, and then I would say, start over. And once you've covered it twice, then maybe turn around and start looking in a different direction. Is this, is this okay, guys? Are you getting value out of this? Okay. Uh, if there's questions that arise, feel free to ask them too. This is actually Jason. He's hunting with me in Mexico. Uh, this is an afternoon. This is probably two or three o'clock in the afternoon. Notice where we're glassing. We're glassing this shady basin here. Notice he's not turning around. Not saying that he wouldn't look at this sun just to see if a buck's chasing a bear over, but most of the time the deer are going to be in the shade uh, in the afternoon. If, if you glass in the afternoon into the shade, you will find more game. Okay, let me go through this. Glassing tips. Be in position before the sun comes up. Let things unfold. Uh, I like to be on my glassing point at least 30 minutes before the sun comes up for several reasons. Uh, I like to glass and watch other headlamps, other hunters. Where, where am I going to have people if all of a sudden I'm up on one of those places where I was showing and there's you know four headlamps and I'm like, okay, I see them coming. Okay, I haven't seen any. I might just start glassing here because I know that these guys are covering all this country. That's why I like to be there. I like to always be sitting in the dark in my glassing point if I can help it. It gives me time to cool down from the hike and I can focus at the task at hand. How many times have you just hiked your butt off to get up to a spot, you're sweating, you're out of breath, and you're kind of flustered. I like to get up there, get my stuff out, get all my gear out, get my tripod set up and just sit there and kind of relax and then go to work. Uh, keep in mind that it's important to, oh, and that I also enjoy watching the sunrises. If you follow uh, any of my stuff on Instagram, you'll see I do uh, a lot of sunrise and sunset photos. Um, I, I really enjoy it. But keep in mind that it is important to keep your optics warm so they don't fog up when you start glassing. What I do when I'm hiking up to a point and it's below 40 degrees, I'm going to keep my binoculars warm. I'm going to keep them uh, in my Kuyu bino harness, but I'm going to have my jacket. And if you say, well, it's going to be too warm to wear a jacket, then in my pack, I'll, I'll wrap the binos up in my jacket. Or sometimes, just if it's cold that I'm just wearing a merino, I'll actually put them next to my skin, underneath my shirt, and keep them warm. I 
I always take my optics inside at night. If I'm truck camping, I try and put them either in my tent, wrap them up and keep them warm. Once they get cold and then they warm up, that's when you're going to get fogged glasses. Another thing, if you're hunting with me on afternoon glassing sessions, I always say stay till pitch black dark. Most animals move at uh, last light. Here's a picture of uh, glassing, you know, basically with no light left. Uh, here's an example of me glassing in the afternoon. Uh, notice I got my shoes off actually, my boots off, and I'm actually glassing some of those shady slopes up there. Now notice, I do, I have broken my rule here of having that center post extended, but notice that I'm also down to my, my it's a three-legged tripod, uh, or, or three extension, but I need just a little bit more. It's okay at times to extend that, just don't make a huge practice of it. Uh, another sunset glassing photo. Here's dog glassing with the 32 power curves. It looks like a, a trip to the chiropractor to me, doesn't it, you guys? Uh, there I am glassing with the curves all hunched over. That's one thing I'm a big proponent. We won't get into it too much, but I like straight binoculars and I like a straight spotting scope. Uh, the, those those curves, those that are in this photo. Uh, if I were to go up to a, t to a peak, which typically I always glass from the top down, because of the angled binocular, I would actually have to get in a stool and hunch over in order to point the binos down, if that makes sense. If you're, if you're glassing from the desert floor up, they're great because you can just tilt them and your objective's pointing up and you can just look down. But the reason I switch to the twin spotters is I like a straight glass. Here's Jason again glassing the afternoon slopes. Here's a, a bighorn sheep hunter of mine. You can see he's glassing the shady basins there in Arizona. Uh, there's afternoon glassing. I mean, that's, that's typical. And 90% of people that come and hunt with me, they're going to not like looking into the sun and looking into that glare. They're going to want to look the other way. But 90% of your animals are probably going to be in the shaded region. One thing to point out there is also, if you get in a glare situation like this, you can actually put something over your head so you don't get that glare of that afternoon sun in your eyes. Uh, that's me looking through a spotting scope at a bighorn ram. That's Hunter Haynes. He's a guide of ours uh, in Mexico at first light. Uh, incredible glasser. He's covering those yellow slopes across there. Uh, glassing tips, learn to glass quickly when, when the time is right and slowly when you need to slow down and pick out details. Uh, don't grid at first light, learn to scan the uh, likely areas where the animals will be. About an hour after first light you can grid, use the system to efficiently cover all the area. We talked about that. I usually start at the top and then I glass horizontally, left to right, side to side. But one of the big tips I can give you, if you're not finding anything, you're probably panning too fast. You need to slow down. Here I am glassing, not on a good glassing knob. If you'll see, I'm kind of on a, on a, on a ridge like this, but I'm doing the best I can to pick these portions out. Can you see how the debris and the brush is kind of in my way? If I found more of a point like this, but sometimes you're just stuck where you're at. Here's some guys uh, glassing standing. It's okay. Uh, it seems like the older, the older people get, the more their backs hurt, or they can't sit forever. They do have to stand, uh, and that's okay. I, I prefer to sit as much as possible. Here's Jason, uh, about to take a shot at a coos deer. Uh, notice. Uh, in this situation, if you're if you're hunting on your own, uh, in this situation, this this would be a good thing. If you've got your uh, binoculars on a tripod, you're about to shoot a bedded deer. As soon as you shoot, you don't know where it went. You can't find it in your scope. Your binoculars are on the tripod on the exact spot. You can you're flustered. He wasn't. He killed him. But he could get up and get right in those binos and go, oh, he's laying there dead. That's a good tip. Before you shoot, put your binoculars on a tripod in the exact spot where you're shooting. Here's Dar looking at a long spot off. 
Um, there's another glass in photo. Let's cover, let's cover some uh, digiscoping tips. Uh, phone scope, uh, I, I like phone scope. It's easy to use with cell phones. Uh, the Swarovski TLSO, TLS APO adapter, in my opinion, gets the best quality images. Um, it's hard for me to read. I'll have to go back over here. Uh, with the DSLR camera, uh, use the zoom on the lens, not the zoom on the camera. Does that make sense? When you zoom in on the phone scope and go full zoom, sometimes you have to go just enough to get the black ring out, but the more you zoom on the camera, the more pixelated it gets. Use the zoom on the spotting scope or the binocular. Uh, on the binocular, obviously, it's going to be a fix, but that's how you, that's how you focus and that's how you uh, get the best image. Uh, uh, set a self-timer on the phone or the camera for best images because if you're, if you're just hitting the button, that's vibration. Vibration is going to cause blurriness. Uh, try not to touch the camera for best results. Here's Brendan, actually, uh, last year on an elk hunt. He's doing some phone scoping. Uh, here's Jason doing some phone scoping. Uh, this is actually a uh, the uh, Swarovski TLS APO adapter. You can't see the adapter, but uh, Dar, he's using a Nikon. He's actually videoing the Ram Curly. Uh, here is, if you look at this photo, we, I'm actually digiscoping Rams that are up there. You can see the image there. And the next photo is actually what I'm actually shooting. So, so, so you go from this photo to that photo, and that, that's actually what I'm looking at there. There's Curly, d d took a lot of digiscope of him. There's an image Dar took of Curly. Uh, here's a big orange sheep hunter of mine doing some phone scoping. Uh, okay, do you guys have any questions on glassing before we do? Uh, go ahead. Yeah, it's not your first set. Yep. What are we hunting? Coos white tail. Most of the time, I won't just hand scan unless there's some open hillside that I think, oh, a buck could be right there. Most of the time, I'm going to slip into my new spot. I'm going to set my tripod up. I'm going to get as low as possible, and then I'm going to scan quick when I first sit down. Uh, that's how I would do it. Yes, sir. Um, binocular with a built-in rangefinder, that's something I didn't cover. I think they're fantastic. I use the Swarovski uh, EL range. Um, Leica makes a good pair as well. Zeiss makes a good pair. Uh, that's kind of the trend these days, and, and I like it. Uh, I use them a lot. Uh, uh, I have two doll sheep hunts this summer. I have one in Arctic Red and one in, uh, with Lance in Alaska, and I'm actually going to take my 10 by 42 ELs, or excuse me, yeah, my ELs, not the EL range, and then I'm going to carry a little loophole range, fi range finder on my belt. Actually, in the Kuyu, on my belt in the Kuyu pouch. Yes? Do you have any issues with uh, the tools Potter said? He asked if I have any issues with what? Okay, he asked if I have any issues with the dual spotters, which we saw a photo of, they're about this long, and he's asking if I have problems with them getting knocked out of alignment. I have not, but I'm pretty careful with them. I actually have a really nice case. The Outdoorsman's makes this case that, that actually fits them perfect, and I put them in my pack. If they were to get out of alignment, I could take them out and probably get, get them straightened back out, but I've used them two full seasons now and never had them knocked out. Yes. Any sense about whitetail hunting in Northern California with uh, heavier cover? Yeah, so um, I don't want to, I'm only speculating because I have not blacktail hunted, but if you have the ability to see country, I'm going to use a lot of these same principles of get high, get where you can see, even if you can't see a lot, it could give you something that could push you over the edge of finding a buck that maybe you wouldn't see if you're down in the timber. I would rather glass smaller bits of country than wander around in the timber. If I'll take whatever I can see and take my chances from there. Any other tip or questions? Do you recommend just lighter weight spot and scopes and tripods if, if you're going to be walking the whole time? Yeah, so the, the tripods that are light are the outdoorsmen's. That's a machined aluminum tripod. They make it in several sizes. 
And then there's a company called Slick, uh, S-L-I-K. Uh, they make carbon fiber tripods, and they are very lightweight. Uh, both are expensive. One is uh, machine aluminum, one is carbon fiber. And then binoculars. Is that what you asked? For a light, lighter spotting spot scope. Yeah, so what I use is a Swarovski. I'm a huge believer in Swarovski binoculars, but in my opinion, you guys go on, you do a lot of expensive stuff. I would buy Swarovski, Leica, or Zeiss. That, that would be what I would tell you. If you're going to splurge on anything, splurge on your optics. To answer your question specifically, I like the 65 millimeter objective. The modular system by Swarovski that has the 30 to 70 eyepiece. That's the one that I will be taking to the Northwest Territories and doll sheep hunting. Thank you. Yeah, I, just, yeah. I, I flipped through the Swarovski BTXs in the showroom. Yes. So the question is, he's looked through the Swarovski BTX um, in the showroom, but not in the field, and he wants to know about field of uh, depth of field. Right. I have not. I've actually been very impressed with the BTX. I have the 65 millimeter and the 95 millimeter, and I've been very impressed with both. Now, when it's game time, the twin Swarovski spotters are in my pack. I. I have gotten to where I don't like to look down. If I took a poll in the audience, 50% of you would say, I don't like straight, I like angled. I'm a straight, I like looking straight. Where when I get up high, I can look straight down and don't have to go like this. But it's a phenomenal product if you're okay with angled, uh, you know, the, the angled look. Any other questions? Besides the angle, if the if the Swarovski BTX was not angled, I would use the Swarovski BTX hands down. Because of the issue that he brought up that if they do get knocked out of alignment, I'm hosed. If Swarovski BTX was made in a straight, it would be my go-to 100%. That's a good question. I should know the technical answer of that. I, I believe the twin spotters. I should know the answer of it, and I don't. I can tell you when I'm glassing, I have no problem with the field of view and the twin spotters at all. I feel like the twin spotters have a wider field of view. I've never actually tested it, gotten someone out there at, you know, a thousand yards and actually measured it. But to my eye, I feel like the twin spotters have a wider field of view. There were some questions over here. Nope. Okay. Perfect. Good. Yeah. Awesome job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was great, Jerry. Thank you. Yeah. I learned about